Hello and welcome once again to Better Business Bureau Serving Connecticut. This show is one of a series that deals with marketplace issues, consumer and business news, scams, tips, public education, and we're also discussing the way that BBB and various government entities protect consumers and businesses here in Connecticut. The leading government entity charged with protecting us in the marketplace is the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection, or DCP as it's commonly known. So in this episode, we're going right to the top of DCP with Commissioner Jonathan Harris. So pleased to have you on the show, Commissioner. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Now, when we talk about Department of Consumer Protection, the first thing that people get in their minds is, all right, well, serious legal problem with someone, we've got to go to DCP. And people do go to DCP. Yes. But you do so much more there. Yeah, we do have one that sort of general power over unfair and deceptive acts, whether they're billing issues or other things with utility companies, not with the rates, uh, or just a business, uh, scams and things like that. We've worked on that with you, with the Better Business Bureau, a lot. Um, but then there are all other areas, whether it's uh, licensed contractors, professional, whether it's a plumber, electrician, a real estate agent, uh, a landscape architect, an engineer. Uh, we do all that licensing, home improvement contractors, new home contractors. We have 230 different credential types, issue about 230,000 different types of credentials, mostly licenses, but some registrations. Difference is that license actually requires you to show a skill, pass a certain test, apprenticeship, things like that, whereas a registration, I could be a registered home improvement contractor. You probably don't want that because I'm <laughs> not the most skilled, but you get protection if you are a registered home improvement contractor and the consumer uses the registered contractor and they have a problem. First of all, there's specific things that need to be in contracts that can provide you with some relief. But if you have a problem, even over workmanship, you sue that contractor, get a judgment, can't recover on it, you can actually go to the Home Improvement Guarantee Fund and recover up to $15,000 from that fund. New home improvement up to $30,000. So that it does provide some extra protection, even a registration, for a homeowner that uses that a person with that credential. What surprised me the most was finding out just how many hats DCP wears. It's, it's not just a question of people coming because of a marketplace dispute. It's also, it's regulatory, but it's also enforcement, isn't it? Yeah, it's both. And that's why you know kind of went off and told you a little bit about the contractors, because that's a big piece. But we also have jurisdiction under the you know main anti-competition, anti-fraud statute in the state, the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act, CUTPA, which you know we have certain powers to go after businesses to keep that playing field level for them, uh, to protect consumers that have been defrauded. A lot of what happened, you said at the beginning that, you know, people look to us kind of as their lawyers, and they do, but there's limits on what we can do. A lot of it will require some private action, and then we can take certain enforcement action against a credential, or maybe under the Unfair Trade Practices Act, or for certain violations of the food codes, public health codes, uh, drug control, other things like that. But um, it's amazing how many people do come to us and, and want like the agency to really act as their lawyer. We'll do everything we can, we'll get the information. We like the complaints because as we share with you and you with us, it's always good to have a picture to monitor what's going on in the marketplace because then we can take, we have a group called the Market Fairness Group that takes proactive action on larger market trends to try to stop them. So between that enforcement and getting out information that we do with you, and you're amazing at that, mm -hmm. to try to help people protect themselves, we can do a lot. I mean, that, the idea of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The more that we can communicate with consumers, businesses, and give them the information that they need to protect themselves, the better off we are. We avoid having to do enforcement actions when damage has been done already and when it's more costly to get results for people. Now, for people who, uh, I suppose the question is, when do you go to DCP? When do you come to Better Business Bureau? That's always a question. You know, we're trying to, now that we've had uh, a cut about 12% of our budget through process reform, through more of a team structure, through cross-training, through adding technology where it makes sense, uh, been able to absorb vacancies and not have to lay off yet, knock on wood, to do that and to focus on the big problems in the marketplace uh, to be able to make it happen. But we are trying also, and we can give you a little mission in a second, to um, do a better job at connecting with groups like the Better Business Bureau, Bureau 
the industry associations, trades associations, realtors, groups on the ground that we can create like this two-way street where we get them information about what the rules are, we're simplifying them, some would call it deregulation, we call it regulation simplification and modernization. Here's what you have to follow, it's simple, we don't want to see you, but if you do, we can talk about enforcement, but the two-way street of getting that information out and then getting better information from whether it's the BBB or these other groups about what's happening in the market and then being able with that and some really kind of interesting algorithms, predictive modeling on enforcement, go to the places where we have the higher incidence of, uh, of violation and then up our enforcement, make examples of people that are actually in violating the law, uh, send that out to the marketplace so that people don't think it's a cost of doing business and they'll think twice, they'll, they'll, they'll wonder. Um, we also want to kind of do a lot more, and we've started with our sister agencies, whether they're within the state government, not to duplicate things, to get more simplified with the local, whether it's health authorities or other people on the ground, federal government, so that um, people will, will basically have the attitude, well, I know what the rules are, and should I violate it? Well, I don't know if I'm going to see DCP or one of their cooperative groups in 10 minutes or 10 months. But if I do, and I'm seriously violating the law, it's going to hurt. That's the theory we're using. Better compliance, better enforcement. It's like when you're out in the woods, maybe walking in the reservoir, and the bear comes along, and then you, you pop off. Some of it's perception, but it's also effectively using your tools at the points in the marketplace where it mean, matters most. So as I explained to you before, the mission is through compliance and enforcement to protect public health and safety and to avoid significant economic harm for consumers and businesses. That's our mission. If it's not to those things, we shouldn't be doing it. When we get complaints at Better Business Bureau from people, it's the same thing. Not all the time, but <coughs> pardon me, the uh, Internal Revenue Service imposter scam, mm -hmm. uh, advanced fee loans, those type of things. And we know that education is the key. And sometimes it just feels like the message is getting out but it shouldn't be happening still. Uh, what's your take on it? What do we do it? Not us, but what is going wrong uh, with society in terms of stopping these things? Yeah, I mean, the fraudsters, scam artists, they're gonna basically, they take different shapes, as you described, different subject matters, but a lot of them are, are pretty much the same. I mean, one, your gut feeling, right? If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Don't enter that transaction. Don't do that business. If you think that you're missing out on something, go directly to a legitimate business that you know through a family member, friend, neighbor, or research, and, and try to take advantage of what you someone's offering you that sounds too good to be true. But they also will use not just that feeling, uh, any type of pressure tactic, fear, uh, the heartstrings. So kidnapping scam, you know, scam that we've had that we've worked on with you where they'll call up and they'll tell someone, usually a senior, that uh, their grandson is either in jail and they need bail or they've been kidnapped and they need ransom. Fear. Got to act. Something bad's going to happen. Or, you know, the tragedy uh, in Italy recently with the earthquake. There will be scam artists that will call and say, come on, give some money to help. And most people want to help. You should help. But go to a charity that you know about in your community, whether it's your church or something else legitimate that you know that people have given money to before. Uh, check out CharityNavigator.com. Take a look at our website, see if we have any information on it. So take a deep breath, do your homework, and do what you can to reach out to a legitimate charity, a business, a contractor, and not just react. So the educational information is there. It's a question of getting people to discuss it with their families and their parents right. and neighbors and colleagues. And it's got a, a lot of it has to become kind of muscle uh, memory in the modern world, right? You know, now with electronics, muscle memory. Someone texts me a link, don't, don't press on it. If you want to get that product, if you want to see if you really owe the IRS money, go legitimately to, by typing in the address in your computer, calling the government, and most places like that don't reach out to you through texts or calls and tell you that you uh, owe money. Um, so do what you can to uh, do your homework and understand as best as possible that you're dealing with a legitimate government agency, a legitimate business, a legitimate charity. And some of that, I think, just has to become kind of muscle memory and then 
people be better able to withstand the scams and fraudsters as they come from all different directions. And some of these fraudsters, criminals, some of them are part of a sophisticated international organization, but some of them aren't so bright. No, they're not. Uh, and, but the key is not to engage in anyone, never give away money right away, you know, look into it, never give away any personal information, whether it's financial or health information. Uh, when you have documents with that on, keep them safe in your home, not out in the open. Shred things, like it's a, whether it's a, a bill or an explanation of benefits that you, uh, that you don't um, need anymore, and like scrutinize those when they come in. Did I make this charge? Did I get my teeth cleaned a, a month ago? Uh, we recommend that people uh, pull their credit report, annualcreditreport.com. You can do that for each of the credit rating agents, I believe. You, can, you probably know this better than I do. Um, so you can do that, I think, three times a year to take a look and see what is happening on your credit. So it's not like these are big things that take a lot of time, but it has to be put into people's lives. And they have to remember also, you can't like, live in fear. You just have to be smart. I mean, I'm going like, to pull out of this uh, driveway. God willing, after I'm done with this interview, there is risk for me doing that. But I do it. But I look both ways, and I make sure I'm operating my vehicle correctly. Same thing with this. Act, but act smart. So in the old days, we were taught, don't get into a car with a stranger. And now it's don't do business over the phone or at your front door. At your front door, over the phone, you know, through a text, through an email. Go to the source and do it that way. And there are plenty of sources for you to do business with. We're blessed with that in this country, that's for sure. One of the things I want to ask you about before uh, I get to a couple of questions about exactly what other uh, services you folks offer is the issue of price gouging. Yep. Uh, is it misunderstood because sometimes we'll get calls from people saying, well, this, this guy wants $500 to shovel my, my driveway in the middle of a blizzard. Is that gouging? You know, we live in a capitalist society. The market, we don't have a lot of control over prices, but there is a price gouging statute. I'm actually trying to learn more about that because there's another context where we're seeing whether it's applicable, uh, and that's with uh, cost of naloxone, also known as Narcan, uh, the drug that's needed to, uh, in overdose uh, situations. We all know the opioid epidemic is, you know, hundreds and hundreds now this year predicting 850 overdoses. In Connecticut, it can give someone uh, a chance at life again by bringing them back, uh, and some of the costs are high. So I'm thinking, well, that's sort of a public health crisis, and the costs are going up. They're gouging there. It would seem to be, but the statute really, in my experience, has been directed towards the natural disasters, the snowstorms, where all of a sudden, you know, the home heating oil, the propane oil, um, other things that you might need to survive a storm uh, go through the roof. They have some ability to raise them because they're a cost of business. So take home heating oil. Um, they might have such demands that they need to go back and fill their truck an extra time. There's extra cost to the business. So they're given some leeway. But if it's too big, it could be price gouging. And we need to look at that in some other areas of public health and safety and see whether we need to change the laws to, to be able to enforce in some newer conditions. Okay, and this is just for certain items. We're not talking across the board. They can't raise it. Right. I mean, if, you know, if if there is a shortage on apples before a snowstorm, and the price of apples quadruples, you know, quintuples, whatever, it'd be hard to say that there was gouging there. I mean, you don't necessarily need the apples to survive. Now, maybe if that was the only food people could get in the store. You know, you could start making an argument, but that, I, I need to look into that statute where we're doing our legislative program. That's one of the things that's actually on our radar. All right. Before I came in today, I was taking a look at uh, the things about DCP that I did not know, <laughs> and it's quite surprising. Probably, I, I know there's a lot that I don't know. After <laughs> well, 20 months, I know enough to be dangerous. That's the problem. <laughs> we could share. You and me will learn as, <laughs> as well as the folks yeah. out there. Um, but I noticed that every day we're seeing signs of DCP's work. So, for example, when I pull up to a gas pump. There's a little sticker on it. Uh, what is that sticker, and why would you folks be involved in that? Yeah, we, uh, we have the Food and Standards Division. Food is in charge of production of food, manufactured food, uh, produce safety on farms, a bunch of other things to make sure our food uh, you know, system is, is safe here in Connecticut, working with the FDA. Uh, but also weights and measures. It's one of the oldest, I don't know if it's the second oldest, third oldest profession in the Bible, but it's up there because, of course, you know, since the beginning of time, exchange based on weights 
Fair exchanges was important. In 1636, Thomas Hooker came to this area. Some of the first laws that they put into place involved weights and measures, fair exchange. So we actually will go and we test out all the scales, whether they're in the front of the store, in the deli, at a jewelry store, or the big scales, they have about 13,000, I believe, whether they're way station scales, uh, places that, uh, that make asphalt or cement, uh, grain feed. Uh, so I actually, I do this with every division. Uh, I go out in the field periodically to see what the frontline workers are. They're the ones that have the knowledge. They're the ones that are doing the hard work. And, you know, despite what people think, most state employees, like most other businesses, nonprofit, for profit, are really good. A lot of them are great. And then, like any place, any profession, you get some that aren't as good. Um, but most are amazing. I learned so much from them. I've gone out and I've learned how to weigh food. I learned how to weigh Mitt Milano's at a stop and shop uh, in Elmwood, Connecticut. And, uh, it just so happened I learned how to do it. Next week I had a complaint on my desk for underweight beef jerky. I could look over the paperwork, see it, not just read the law, read the statute, but picture what went on in the field. And say, yeah, that looks right. They're fine, okay, we can negotiate. And I was better able to do my job because I had a more complete picture. So we will uh, go. I, I learned how to test the big, the big weight slabs when we have actually this truck that you take a 5,000 pound cart on and four, four weights of 5,000 pounds each, run them up and down the slab. Someone in the weight house says whether it's on or off, recalibrate it. Important for businesses not to get ripped off consumers, state buys a lot of asphalt. Right. You don't want the scales, you know, you don't want the thumb on the scale when taxpayers are, are footing the bill. I'm putting the finger on the scale is an old trick yep. that goes back that right. far. All right, let me ask you a couple of things. I was surprised here. Drug Control Division, what would DCP have to do with that? We have historically had control of that. We license all pharmaceutical manufacturers in the state. Um, not a lot of time and energy with that. I think the feds take that up more, but all pharmacies, whether pharmacies like a CVS or an independent, uh, pharmacies within hospitals, sterile compounding that have a lot within hospitals where they're actually kind of like the old mortar and pestle, but you know, taking uh, and making particular uh, drugs, a lot of cancer drugs for people. We make sure that's safe, that all pharmacists, uh, prescribers are licensed. We have a part in the uh, opioid uh, war that, that you know, th to try to stop that epidemic, we run the prescription drug monitoring program, which requires all prescribers to look up somebody's prescribing history before actually writing a prescription to avoid doctor shopping, uh, diversion, um, or um, what's the other one? Doctor shopping, diversion, um, or overprescribing. Uh, and um, we do that. Pharmacists also need to, within a business day, enter into it. It usually happens automatically with a lot of the chains when something is dispensed. So you can't go to the CVS here and then the Rite Aid here or a Walgreens there all in a day to try to get the same thing because they'll look in the over a day's period, and they might see right then, wait, you just got that in the town over. So that's how we help with that. We also uh, operate, we created and operate uh, the uh, most highly regulated and most successful medical marijuana program uh, in the state, uh, in the country, um, where we regulate it like a pharmaceutical model, a highly secure, highly regulated, safe product. You know what you're getting. Uh, we have four producers that actually grow and then manufacture various medicines. A lot of it, not the flower, you know, the Cheech and Chong kind of smoking, but different kinds of pills, topicals, sublinguals. Uh, not all of them get you high in the traditional way. With the THC, that's only one of 85 chemicals. So, you know, the biggest thing is the children, minors, who will have access in limited conditions and harder to get. They will not be able to smoke or vaporize with epilepsy. They found that certain oils with the other cannabinoids in them, a lot of them are eye drops actually, can take a kid that's been seizing sometimes dozens and dozens of times a day down to a few times a week. So it's another healthcare alternative, another choice that physicians, patients, soon APRNs that'll be able to certify patients can have for certain really debilitating conditions. Uh, so that's another exciting program. And it's an alternative to opioids. Uh, people can use this for pain, for relief of symptoms and other things, and not have to use painkillers. A, a 2013 study in the then 17 states, there's about 25, that have medical marijuana programs shows that the, prescri the prescribing of painkillers and opioids down. Quickly. Yeah. And uh, we, we only have a few minutes yeah. left, so let's... I know, I see I can talk all day about no, this. No, this is great. makes my job easier <laughs> here. Um, 
the marketplace now is safer for, for consumers and for businesses than it was, let's go back 50 years. Yeah, because we do product safety, whether it's mattresses, child safety, uh, you know, toys, uh, and the, the products are, are definitely a lot better. Uh, but there's still, you know, things that we need to monitor. Uh, and there are still, you know, not just like scammers, but bad companies, products that aren't uh, up to par. So we do have to take a look at that too. Satisfying work that you do? It's the best job I've ever had. I mean, you know, you add on liquor control, all liquor permits in the state, we issue, uh, we regulate all legal gaming. So whether it's the casinos, making sure that we get um, the 25 cents on the dollar in a fair way and license all of the workers on the casino floor from the person delivering a drink or to a, a dealer, um, to anybody, to the people helping clean. Um, we uh, off-track betting. Uh, and the lottery, so we have all that. We bring in between licensing, the penalties we issue, and gaming about almost $600 million a year. It's about 3% of the state budget, and yet we are only 222 employees to do all of what I just spoke to you about. And um, so it is kind of a daunting task, and we're figuring out ways to do more with less and to focus on the big problems. Uh, and to be able to uh, make it happen in a cheaper way for taxpayers. Out of a $20 billion budget, we are around $20 million, although close to four plus million of that is casino money and lot lottery money. So general fund, we're a little bit north of $15 million out of 20 million, but it's getting tougher. That's why we're deregulating and saying we're only going to you know, hit the things that are important. We have charitable games, bingo, bazaars, things like that. Stuff that, you know, people can get ripped off, but should the state government really be policing the bingo game? That should be the organization that does that. Right. So we're trying to go to a model where, you know, in a lot of ways, state government over time, not anyone's fault, has become like a spork incrementally. It's become, you know, tries to be a fork and a spoon, and it doesn't necessarily do either one very well. We're saying we're going to pick what we are, we're going to put the resources in that, the public health and safety, avoiding significant economic harm to businesses and consumers. Put it to that so we can make a real difference and, and try to do much more with much less. And we have time for one more question. Sure. Are Connecticut businesses responsive? Uh, most of the time it's a mistake, as well as people who are, who are doing it to make a buck illegally? Yeah. I mean, most businesses just want to be left alone, and we're trying to do that, unless they seriously violate, or to uh, and have a level playing field on which to compete. And so we help them do that, and they help us do that. So there's a good partnership there. And, you know, the bad actors, we're going to make sure that they're punished and that that message is sent to the marketplace. But, but most of them are very good just trying to do the right thing. So stay out of their way. Let them make the money, unless they step over the line. Great. And if people want more information, they have the opportunity to go to the uh, website for yep. the uh, Department of Consumer Protection. CT.gov uh, uh, slash DCP. Easy uh, to remember. Yeah, see, <laughs> CT.gov dot DCP. I got too many uh, emails and stuff with crumbling foundations and other things that we're doing. Also, <laughs> too many little uh, uh, sites in my head. We'll make sure that the consumers go to the right place. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Harris, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for all you do. Well, that's it for this edition of Better Business Bureau Serving Connecticut. Many thanks to our guest, the Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Consumer Protection, Jonathan Harris. And many thanks to Nutmeg TV and the folks who work here to bring you these informative and interesting programs. You can share what you've learned with members of your family and friends and colleagues and neighbors. Education is the ultimate tool to protect ourselves from criminals who are after our money and personal information. If you have a marketplace dispute uh, or want to inquire about a particular business, professional or charity, or simply learn more about consumer and marketplace issues, you'll be able to look that up if you like at bbb.org. Until next time, thank you for letting us uh, join you in your home. I'm Howard Schwartz, and we'll see you next time.